Welcome back to the Imperfectionist Podcast. My name is David Rendell, and we're starting off with some imperfection. If you are watching this on YouTube, you'll notice that it looks a tiny bit different, and that's because I'm using my FaceTime camera inside of my Mac uh, because my professional camera setup isn't working because I updated my operating system in my Mac to um, one of the newer versions and somehow that's not compatible with uh, whatever my camera's doing. So we're running on a slightly different uh, system today. Uh, but that's fine because as you'll see over my shoulder there, we got some cool new framed pink goldfish posters. Stan and I put together some cool posters for our 2021 nationwide uh, book tour for pink goldfish. And I thought it was a shame to let them go to waste. And so I got some frames and it turns out that that uh, bookshelf there is a perfect spot for them. They look nice. Um, so I'm excited about that. For those of you, again, tuning in, and I'd encourage you to on YouTube, we got some cool new sunglasses this time. You see the pink there. I've worn these before. Uh, when I was the MC uh, for an event, uh, that was mafia themed. Um, so that's kind of fun. And I've got an Augusta uh, Masters uh, golf shirt that was a gift from uh, someone that I did speaker coaching for named Ron Shu, uh, who's out of Alabama. I believe he's also an EO member, Entrepreneurs Organization member. So lots of worlds colliding there. And it's certainly a pink uh, Masters golf shirt. And I um, think I'm going to get back into golfing a little bit more. Um, I like golfing. And now that my kids are grown up, I have a little bit more time. So I might spend a little more time on the golf course, which is going to make golf shirts um, a little bit more important. So we got a bunch of fun updates happening. If you've been tuning in in the past, you know that I'm a huge fan of Subpar Parks, which is a book by Amber Share about all the one-star reviews that people give to national parks. And I hinted uh, in a past episode that she had a new book coming out and it is ready. It is called Subpar Planet. I pre-ordered it and so I got it immediately on October 1st and I am super excited. Uh, this includes parks, negative reviews for parks from all over the world. So lest you think it's an American phenomenon to be less than excited about amazing things, um, it is not. It is a worldwide global phenomenon, and she uh, shares that in this book. So I'm really excited to dig into it, um, and I haven't had a chance yet, but I all I did was open the front, and it's perfect because sort of the dedication says, for everyone who has ever been on the receiving end of negative feedback, you're in good company. In other words, you're not alone. There's always haters. You're never going to make everyone happy. Um, and it just reinforces uh, the message that we're trying to reinforce here on the Imperfectionist podcast. So it has uh, parks from the Americas, Europe, Africa, Asia, and Oceania, which includes Australia um, and New Zealand. Uh, so I'm excited to uh, dig into this. Nothing from Antarctica. Apparently no national parks or no no big parks down there. I would guess someone's given a negative review to just Antarctica um, itself. Uh, so I'm excited to dig in. I already uh, found the Eiffel Tower, for example. Uh, it said it's just a big hunk of steel. Uh, so again, somebody sees the Eiffel Tower, which most people would think is pretty cool. And this person decided it wasn't. Um, I reference the Leaning Tower of Pisa a lot at the end of my presentations because people love it because it leans. Great example of imperfection. And the review here is it just looks silly. So again, somebody went um, <laughs> to one of the, the coolest um, and most recognizable maybe, uh, you know, monuments in the world. Uh, buildings in the world and decided it just looks silly. And yeah, I looked to check uh, uh, Eiffel Tower, uh, a big hunk of steel, which is weird because it's not even really a hunk. It's kind of all in, you know, it's it's nicely connected together. It's not solid. 
Um, it's got a lot of space in there. So anyway, excited to dig into that. If you like to laugh, if you like to travel, and again, if you want to be reminded that it's okay to be imperfect and that even if you were perfect, whatever that would mean, somebody would be disappointed with you. Uh, that's a great book to check out. I also just finished a book. Um, I did 75 hard um, a couple months ago. And one of the requirements of 75 days of doing hard things is reading 10 pages of a book. I'm a big reader, so that isn't that hard for me. Uh, but I did decide to make it a habit and um, no pressure. Just when I go to bed, grab the book and take a look and, uh, you know, read for as long as I want to. Now that I'm not doing 75 hard, it doesn't have to be 10 pages. Uh, but I really liked this one. It's called Rediscovering the Greatest Human Strength. It's called Willpower by uh, Roy Baumeister and John Tierney. And the big insight from this book which is really important to the imperfectionist is that willpower is a limited resource. Now, why is that important? Because people, when they say they want to lose weight, they need to use willpower. If they want to have better relationships, they need to use willpower. If they're going to get promoted at work, they need to use willpower. If they're going to exercise more, they need to use willpower. And what some people try to teach you is that willpower is like this muscle and you can get more and more and more of it. But what Baumeister and Tierney show in the book is that you have a limited supply based on even things like how much sleep you got and how healthy your meals were. Um, but you have a limited supply every day. And when you use willpower on anything, it affects your ability to use willpower on anything else. So the simplest example that I give, and I always called it a self-control tank, they would call it a willpower tank. Um, but since it's a limited resource, what you want to do is focus on fuel efficiency. How do I use the least amount of self-control on certain things so I have it available for other things because you can't just keep making more and more and more and more of it um, all day. And so this is why... Uh, acceptance of your weaknesses is so important because you don't have unlimited willpower to fix everything. And also why alignment is so important, because if you work in a situation that fits you and like we talked about, potentially actually fills you up instead of uh, emptying you out, then you'll have more self-control left over for those other things that you care about, your relationships, your health, things like that. And the opposite is also true. If you go to work every day and your work sucks the life out of you, that's really what it's doing. That's why we use those terms. That's Baumeister's thing, right? There's a there's a reservoir of self-control. There's a limited amount. There's, a, there's as I call it, a self-control tank. And when you go to work and it requires you to be someone that you're not and do things that don't match who you are, it literally drains you. It empties you out. It sucks the life out of you. And then you're not as patient with your kids as you could be. You're not as uh, compassionate to your spouse as you could be. You don't have energy left over to exercise. You don't want to eat healthy because you just want to eat something that feels good because work makes you feel bad. And the reason I focus so much on work is because we spend so much of our time in those situations and we can change those in a way that you don't just say, I'm going to change my kids. Um, you can get divorced and change your spouse, but oftentimes that's just going to lead to a different set of things that you would need to do to adjust to whoever that next relationship is. But sometimes that can be an important change that you need to make. Sometimes the people don't fit us. Some, sometimes somebody loves something about you and somebody else hates it about you. Um, for example, there's spouses who love that their partner is spontaneous and there's other people who hate it that their partner is spontaneous. So um, there, there's room for fit there as well. But I think the biggest uh, lever that we have um, is our work. And the, the mistake that people make is believing people will tell you self-control is like a muscle. Um, and it's not. In fact, one of the interesting things that they found in all of the studies that they referenced in this book is that the people with the most self-control are the people who try to use it the least. In other words, they recognize it's a limited resource. So for example, they try to set up habits and other things where they don't have to make decisions because decisions deplete your self-control tank. 
um, doing things that you don't like to do and don't want to do depletes your self-control tank. And so people with more self-control aren't people who are going out of their way to use more of it, which is always kind of what we're taught. They're people who use it selectively. And one of the ways to use it selectively is not to be using it 40 to 60 hours a week uh, when you're at work and doing things that don't fit you. And also it just applies to everything. If you like taking a comfortable walk outside in the nice weather or on a nature trail, um, then do that for exercise because that will fill your self-control tank and make you healthier and will not deplete your self-control tank. Whereas pushing yourself to run or do CrossFit, if those things don't match who you are, uh, won't do that. Um, take up jujitsu, pick up weightlifting, Start exploring what, what are things I can do that don't actually require willpower and yet are uh, good for me. That's the primary lesson. We have a limited amount um, and that the way to have a better life isn't to get more willpower or to look for more ways to have to use it. It's to avoid using it um, except for almost in emergencies and make sure we always have something left. There's this book I read a long time ago called Margin, uh, which also kind of talks about avoiding emergencies. And the point is, if you don't use up all your energy every day, you'll have some left over. If you don't, um, if you don't use up all the money that you make every week, then you'll have some left over for an emergency. If you don't use up all your patience, you'll have some left over. It's basically the idea you should always have, an, have a reserve of basically every possible resource just in case um, something goes wrong instead of always pushing yourself uh, to the edge. So I guess since we're talking about books and I'll delve into some of these a little bit deeper um, in a future episode, but I'm just kind of doing a smorgasbord this time. Um, I talked about this book. I think I referenced it a little bit, bit. We might dig in a little bit more today called Rare Breed by Sonny Bonnell and Ashley Hansberger, A Guide to Success for the Defiant, a Dangerous, and Different. I just finished this book, uh, well, right before the, um, the uh, um, Willpower book, and this is just 100% imperfectionist. I'm hoping to get uh, these ladies on the Imperfectionist podcast. But what they basically have is seven types of what they call a rare breed, a uniquely successful person. And they have some or all of these seven types of characteristics that we've been taught to think are negative. And what they say is actually that they're very, very positive. There was an article that they wrote and said, we oftentimes are looking to fire people who have these characteristics when we should be promoting them, right? We're oftentimes looking to fire these people when we should be promoting them. In other words, we see these characteristics as negatives, as imperfections, as disadvantages, but they're actually advantages. They're actually positive. They're actually good. They're actually strengths and weaknesses. Again, not that they're not weaknesses, but that they're both and that there's something very, very valuable. And so the whole book is just going through these seven characteristics one by one and talking to you about how to exploit these imperfections that you might have and not be ashamed of them, be unashamed and unapologetic about them to flaunt them like we've talked about before on the podcast. And so I'll go through each of them and maybe we'll dig into them um, a little bit. The first one is rebellious. So think about that, right? When you're in school, does anybody ever teach you it's good to be rebellious? No, it's bad to rebel. It's good to follow the rules. It's good to do what you're told, all these kinds of things. And so they have you know, geez, 40 pages, 40 plus pages on the upside of being uh, rebellious. One of my uh, archetypes, one of my defining features for the Amplify assessment is revolutionary rebel. These are people who are trying to change things, trying to improve things, trying to create progress, upsetting uh, the status quo and the way things currently are. And again, I talk about how um, that's uh, a strength and a weakness at the same time, it has an upside. You shouldn't stop being rebellious. There's ways to be successful because you're rebellious, not even though you're rebellious. So one of them is rebellious. The next one is audacious. Well, you know, oftentimes we say, oh, this person had the audacity 
to question me or to attempt this thing that seemed unreasonable. Um, and it takes a certain about a rebellion to do that, because I'm sure if you have audacity, people are telling you to dial it back. So what is audacity? It's, it's sort of an extreme idealism. It's a belief that you can accomplish something that other people can't. So what are people going to tell you? They're going to tell you to be more realistic. So, But let's watch about this for a second. But if you're really realistic, then people are going to criticize you for being negative and critical and not being open to exciting things that might happen. And that's the other main idea behind the Imperfectionist podcast is you're never going to make everybody happy. And when you do more of what people tell you you should do, they're going to criticize you on the other side as well. So if you are audacious, be audacious. If you are rebellious, be uh, rebellious. And again, if you are realistic and practical, also be realistic and practical. And when people criti criticize you for being negative and critical or, or not believing that amazing things are possible, that's fine because you're busy uh, being reasonable and practical um, and nibbling away and slow and steady wins the race and all of those kinds of things as well. So this isn't criticizing people on either side. In fact, it's saying whichever is yours, be more of that. Don't use your willpower to try to push yourself to be the opposite kind of person. So audacious is the second, they call them virtues. Again, because why? Because people oftentimes think of them as vices. So they're like, it's a virtue to be rebellious. It's not a vice. It's a virtue to be audacious. Um, uh, not a vice. The third one is obsessed. We talk a lot about this. In fact, there's a whole section in the freak factor about the value of obsession. What do people tell you? You need to moderate, reduce, and eliminate everything in moderation. Don't be obsessed. Don't go too far. Don't go too much. That's why the assessment's called amplify. Turn up the volume when everybody's telling you to turn it down. And so they're talking about the upside of being um, obsessed instead of, hey, don't be obsessed, uh, you know, don't be, un you know, and then you start to see these things going together, right? Don't go too far, don't do too much, don't go beyond the point that most people think is reasonable. The next virtue, virtue number four is hot-blooded, uh, in other words, just passionate, right? Um, passionate. Um, so again, don't be uh, too excited, don't let uh, that take over. Again, calm down, moderate, be realistic. Don't go too far. Don't get too excited. Um, don't care too much. Um, instead of care a lot, uh, let your passion drive you. I mean, you can probably hear it when I do this. When I do this podcast, I get fired up about these ideas. I think they have the potential to help you. I think they have the potential to make your life better. I know they've done that for me. When I give my presentations, I'm genuinely passionate about what I'm talking about. And I think that comes through and I'm not trying to tone that down. Um, I'm trying to crank that up. So that's what they're encouraging, right? Turn up the volume on these characteristics. Don't be ashamed, be unashamed and unapologetic, flaunt these things. Um, I mean, the next one is perfect. Uh, it's just weird. Virtue number four is weird um, instead of uh, normal. And again, they give what's nice is they give real practical ways. When I say turn up the volume, this book's fantastic. Again, rare breed. Um, this book's fantastic for giving you real practical tips and giving you examples of unique and interesting individuals um, who have done this and who have been, in this case, weird. And it's been very, very successful for them. And as you, you know, even just look behind me or look at me, and I'm sure that catches some people's attention. And every time I do a call with somebody, um, every time people meet me for the first time and they see this background, they've got questions. What's going on? What's with all the pink? What's with all the shoes? What's with all that stuff? And that's one of the values of weird. It gets people to ask questions. It gets people interested. It gets people's attention. So if you didn't need any other reason to be weird, it's exactly that, that it gets people's attention um, and that's valuable, especially when uh, you're in a career or in a business that requires people's attention. And certainly my business is one of those uh, businesses. So virtue five is weird. A virtue six is hypnotic. This is sort of uh, another word for it would be charismatic. The kids are calling it Riz uh, these days. And, um, you know, they talk about the upside of being a person who can win people over and convince people 
and motivate people and inspire people? And is there a downside? Have there been leaders over time who've manipulated people and uh, used that manipulation to oppress uh, people? Absolutely. Right? But the characteristic itself isn't a negative, and they spend a lot of time on this, and I think this is worth talking about for a second. Their point is it's how you use it, right? It's how you use it. And again, that goes to alignment. Where are you using it? What's the purpose you're using it for? They talk a lot about the importance of purpose and vision, trying to make the world a better place, using these characteristics to help and not to hurt. So again, it isn't the characteristic itself. For example, um, I'm in uh, Eastern North Carolina. I'm about an hour east of Raleigh, but four hours west of me is Western North Carolina, Asheville, um, which you've been seeing in the news uh, because we just had uh, a hurricane, Helene, come through and just devastate, um, just devastate um, that area. And one of the things that people love to criticize is social media. Social media is ruining kids' lives and it's ruining America, and all these kinds of things. Social media isn't a good or a bad thing. The question is, how do you use it? And during and in the aftermath of this hurricane, social media is enabling people to communicate with people they wouldn't otherwise be able to communicate with. It's enabled, enabling people to post needs and see that people have needs. I mean, one guy saw on social media that people needed stuff. He was down in South Carolina. He jumped in his helicopter, who has a helicopter um, that he uses, I think, for some kind of work that he does. And he put his son in the helicopter and they went up and started rescuing people from places where they were stranded with no water and no power and maybe no home anymore and no way to get out other than uh, through the air. He wouldn't have been able to do that without social media. He wouldn't be able to find out about that on television uh, or on the radio. Social media isn't good. It's not bad. It can be used for good and it can be used for bad. The internet's the same way. People use it for bad things every day. People use it for good things every day. So it gets us thinking not about the characteristic itself, it gets us thinking about how do you choose to use it. And so when I'm talking about alignment and finding the right fit and using these characteristics as strengths and not weaknesses, I'm not minimizing the potential downside. What I'm saying is you can use it for you know good instead of evil, for positive instead of negative purposes. And that really does have a lot to do with how uh, people perceive it. And so uh, hypnotic is the sixth one, which again is basically charismatic. So they talk about the value of that. And then the last one is emotional. Um, virtue number seven is emotional, which is uh, like sensitive. And again, we've talked about this in the past. There's a whole book by Jen Graneman that I would encourage you to check out called sensitive if you are sensitive or have a loved one who is sensitive. But sensitive is vulnerable. Sensitive is emotional. And so we think of those as negatives and you got to toughen up and have a thicker skin. You've heard me talk about that before. And their point in rare breed is that you don't that there's huge value to be sensitive to being open and compassionate. In fact, that's something that you're seeing right now in Western North Carolina. The people who are sensitive to the needs of those who've been hurt, and it's not just in Western North Carolina, in Eastern Tennessee, um, down in uh, Florida, near the Panhandle and along uh, the, the Western side of Florida on the Gulf Coast. Uh, people in Augusta, Georgia, which is one of the reasons that I wore this shirt today, um, who've been negatively affected by this hurricane. It's our sensitivity, our ability to feel the pain or at least understand the pain that other people are going through and wanting to alleviate that pain that makes us compassionate and caring for those people. And you've also seen the opposite, very negative responses, uh, very critical responses. Why didn't you evacuate? Why didn't you know? Why didn't you plan? Why are we having to help you? Uh, why couldn't you have done something better? Which which is ridiculous in this situation, hurricanes, um, Nobody evacuates for hurricanes hundreds of miles inland, which is where these places are. Those aren't the places usually affected by hurricanes. Um, and no one knew and no one told them to evacuate. Um, and so, but you do get some of those responses, right? Uh, you know, these, these uh, responses that show a lack of empathy. But again, there's advantages to having that kind of perspective on the world. But what they're talking about in rare breed is the upside of being 
uh, emotional, being compassionate, being sensitive, uh, being caring. And again, not trying to suppress that, but looking for opportunities to express that. Ooh, that was nice. I didn't even think of that ahead of time to not suppress it, um, but to express it. So uh, especially if any of those characteristics sounded like you, uh, rare breed might be very encouraging um, for you. If any of those characteristics sounded like uh, people in your family, um, also people that you work with, or if you're trying to understand better people who work with you or for you, I'd really recommend that. And if you need encouragement, uh, we like we talked about last time, one of uh, the listeners uh, runs her own business and is a little concerned about being too weird. Um, Sonny and Ashley, the authors of that book, run a marketing consulting company where they encourage people to be weird and to stand out and be unusual. And so you'll definitely find some encouragement in that book. So, all right. Speaking of marketing, I'm drinking my uh, liquid death mountain water and somebody sent me I think it was Stan Phelps, my co-author for Pink Goldfish. We use Liquid Death in our book. And you know, I'm not sponsored by Liquid Death. Uh, and yet I'm a big fan. And so they just did a limited edition, one of a kind um, sale on their website as an auction. They're marketing it as a life-sized casket for death-sized beverages. So Liquid Death partnered with Yeti. Um, and I am not sponsored by Yeti, um, but this cup is a Yeti cup. Um, I think I got it at an event uh, one time. You know, they have those swag kind of giveaways um, at some kind of event, and I put fun stickers on it. I used this for 75 Hard. One of the requirements of 75 Hard is drinking a gallon of water every day, and this cup was perfect for that because it's 26 ounces which means that if you drink uh, five of those, you've drunk uh, 130 ounces and 128 ounces is a gallon. So I just knew I needed to fill this up and drink this five times a day. So Liquid Death uh, partnered with Yeti on this casket cooler. And so it's big and white and it looks exactly like... Um, I'll zoom in there. It looks exactly like a casket. And basically it has two kind of cooler units inside of it and uh, can be lifted up either one side or the other side, just like a casket. You can lift up the, the top part where the person's head would be or the bottom part where their feet would be. Um, you don't have to open it all at once. It looks exactly like a casket. and uh, But inside it's a Yeti cooler. Um, it holds, how much does it hold? 378 12 ounce cans um, or 252 19.2 ounce cans. That's the uh, the tall boy, these big cans here. And so they did an auction. They got 810 bids and the uh, liquid death casket um, went for $68,200. Uh, um, so again, another unique uh, very unusual, one of a kind um, <laughs> promotion and sale. They made sixty-eight thousand dollars, but also they got people talking about uh, their product and their uh, marketing, and got people sharing things with other people. So again, really playing into that death thing. Which again, there's literally something called life water. There's stuff called smart water. They do the total opposite, liquid death. Um, and I love just everything about it, including the, the front part, a life-sized casket for death-sized beverages. So that's the other thing. This is not a model. This is not a miniature. This is a full-sized, life-sized uh, casket uh, for uh, liquid death. So just hilarious. I love it. Uh, they just keep it coming. And uh, that's why I love, uh, that's why I love liquid death. Uh, mountain water. So another one that got sent to me was, um, I think it got sent to me on Instagram uh, from, I think my friend Keith. And um, there's an interesting, uh, if you know anything about baseball, there's a very successful baseball player called Shohei uh, Otani. And he hit a home run 
uh, in a game. And you know that baseball stadiums on the inside are just covered in all of these advertisements and electronic signs. And he hit uh, one of the signs with the home run. He, he hits these uh, huge home runs. He's one of the first players maybe ever or at least in a long time, he just went over 50 home runs and 50 stolen bases. He also pitches, um, which is very rare to have somebody be a good pitcher uh, and a good hitter. And so he's very um, unusual and very uh, successful. And so he hit a home run and it hit this LED uh, display that was advertising a Coors Light, and it knocked out the top left-hand corner of the display and made it go uh, black. And so he damaged it, right? He damaged it. He created an imperfection uh, in that sign. And so Coors Light, uh, you know, could have responded in the normal way, and the stadium could have as well in just fixing that little spot. But what Coors Light decided to do was start selling uh, cans of Coors Light that uh, had a little black square uh, on the can by the logo in the same way that he damaged that particular sign. In other words, they turned an imperfection uh, into an advertisement uh, in the book. And I think we've talked about this in the past, that's called Wabi Sabi, intentional imperfection. When he broke that sign, that wasn't an intentional imperfection, but they decided to flaunt it, be unashamed and unapologetic, use it as a discussion point and recognize that imperfection is sort of attractive and interesting to people. And so they created limited edition cans of Coors Light that had a little black square again in the same sort of spot on the logo where the sign was damaged and they sold out very, very quickly. Um, and in fact, one of them, I believe, has been auctioned off um, for a, a lot of money. And so that was a cool um, thing that they did that, again, uh, they call it, they say here that uh, a sharp uh, Canadian ad agency, Rethink, which works for Molson Core, saw an opportunity rather than a problem a lights out campaign, they called it, was built around the dead pixels on the board, including billboard ads that built in the black square and even commemorative can that included the blotch, right? So again, if you said that we're going to, um, you know, advertise dead pixels or blotches, uh, most people would tell you that that's a bad idea. But even look at the name of the company that came up with it, the ad agency Rethink. Um, and they love the way they called their campaign lights out. So the lights went out. Obviously, you'd think it's time to turn the lights back on. And they said, what if we did something with this? And the campaign went viral. Um, in fact, here's how valuable this was. So sometimes people say like, okay, Dave, this is cute. And this is funny. But like, does it work? Or does it pay off? And we've talked about this before. But here's how much it paid off. Shohei Otani is from Japan. And he is, you know, he's super famous here. He's even more famous uh, in Japan. And the campaign went so viral that it increased the demand in the Japanese market um, for uh, Coors Light. In fact, it almost hints that maybe it wasn't really being sold or certainly wasn't very available there. And now there's huge demand for Coors Light because it's got this connection with this national sports hero. So again, rethink uh, imperfection and look for opportunities to flaunt what looks like a weakness. And again, it was actual physical damage. The lights were supposed to be on and they were out. Uh, the billboard was supposed to be perfect and it was imperfect. And then they deliberately, right, that was unintentional, but they highlighted it. They illuminated imperfection. That's phase one of Pink Goldfish and, and, and Freak Factor but specifically with businesses, but then they didn't just illuminate that one imperfection, they left that billboard damaged. Then they also started creating intentionally imperfect billboards and intentionally imperfect cans and actually opened up an entirely new market for themselves and also got a lot of attention for a brand that would otherwise just be, you know, it's one of the big beers, Bud Light, Coors Light, Miller Light. Um, it's not something, it's not an IPA or some cool uh, something on draft or something that people tend to be talking about. And they got people talking about it because imperfection 
is interesting, right? Imperfection is in interesting. And a lot of in innovations start off looking like imperfections, looking like mistakes, uh, looking like weaknesses. So subpar planet, check it out. Willpower, uh, check it out. Rare breed, check it out. You can tell I'm a reader. That's one of my um, things. Uh, one of my strengths, like I said, on the strengths finder is input. Uh, we got the coffin cooler from uh, Liquid Death. We got the Coors Light. Um, hey, you could take your special Coors Light cans um, from the Lights Out campaign and put them in your uh, Liquid Death uh, coffin cooler. And now you got a real a combination there. Um, so I think what I'm going to finish up with today is... Um, talking about uh, body positivity. I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, I've always had a weird body. And um, when I was a kid, I was really, really, really skinny, um, sort of grotesquely skinny. Um, I joke that you could see my heart beating even when my shirt was on. Um, at the time when I was younger, um, in the early 80s, there was a huge famine in Ethiopia. And um, there was all of these images on television of these starving children with these distended bellies. Um, and people, when they would make fun of me, would call me Ethiopian, basically saying I looked like I was starving um, and use that as a way to tease me. So I'm not exaggerating how thin I was, right? It was a point of um, discussion, basically, everywhere that I went. I played basketball and fans from the other team would chant things like walking stick. Um, a teacher called me Twiggy. I think I've mentioned some of this on the past and not just called me that, made it my nickname. Um, Twiggy was the first sort of thin supermodel back um, in the early days of a changing view of what a, a beautiful woman's body looked like and no 13 year old boy, or at least most I don't think want to be compared to uh, having the body of a female supermodel. You're trying to be strong, you're trying to be tough, whatever that happens to be. Um, and so, uh, you know, when I graduated high school, I was six foot four and 145 pounds. Um, there's currently, I know exactly what that looks like and you could too, there's currently a player on the Connecticut Sun. I forget her name off the top of my head. She was just in the playoffs playing against Caitlin Clark. And we noticed how thin and, and tall she looked and she's six foot four and 145 pounds. And that's what I looked like when I graduated from high school is literally like, you know, a WNBA player. So, um, and she's even wearing like long sleeves, like people wear now and long pants under her, you know, like long leggings underneath, probably because it does look pretty wild to be six foot four and 145 pounds. So I've always had a weird body, never strong, never big muscles, and even thin in a way that, you know, no one's trying to be thin like that, where it's sort of awkward and looks sort of unhealthy. And then when I do gain weight, um, it doesn't make my arms any bigger and it doesn't make my legs any bigger. It just makes my stomach bigger, which then makes me look ridiculous in a different way. I've always told people I can look ridiculous because I'm fit and I can look ridiculous because I'm fat but I never really look like a person that anybody else wants to look like or anybody wants to put on the cover of any kind of sort of fitness or um, fashion magazine or something like that. And so we talk in Pink Goldfish about Ashley Graham, who's one of the first plus size models to sort of really become um, famous and definitely flaunts um, her size and that she's not a skinny, scrawny, undernourished um, person with a body that no one else could ever really have without potentially having an eating disorder and how she ended up on the cover of the Sports Illustrated um, Swimsuit Edition. And um, we talk about other examples of that, Justine Bateman and her book Face, uh, which is about just letting yourself grow old gracefully and not worry about Botox and not worry about coloring your hair and not worry about the fact that you don't look like you're 20 when you're not 20 and that that's okay. Um, but today I'm not really gonna talk about body positivity as it relates to other people because I don't wanna get into an argument with people about that. 
um, because this isn't really, I'm not discussing bo body positivity as it relates to other people. I'm talking about it as it relates to me, because this has been something that I've always struggled with. I would wear, you know, big t-shirts under my tank top for basketball, uh, because I recognize that you could see, you know, my shoulder bones sticking out and my elbows, uh, sticking out and my knees sticking out. And I looked weird and I looked, I thought bad and I never, you know, liked the way that I looked and I was always trying to find a way to sort of hide it or cover it up. And at least in the late eighties and early nineties, baggy clothes were in style, um, and so you could kind of be in style and cover up the fact that you looked emaciated um, at the same time. Uh, and I certainly never jumped on the skinny jeans trend um, when it happened because there was no way um, I was going to show off. You know, I have a 36 inseam. I have to buy my pants on the Internet. Um, there was no way that I was going to show off those kinds of proportions. And especially if I'm a little overweight, which is always on top, I'm going to have these super skinny legs and then this pregnant looking belly hanging over these skinny jeans. And I wasn't going to accentuate those proportions because I don't like the way that it looks. And so I think a lot about that when I try to be fit and I try to lose weight and I'm exercising, I'm healthy, whether my weight's up or whether my weight's down, is what role does body positivity have for me? Not in my acceptance of other people, um, which isn't something that we're talking about today. Um, and I do support that with other people. Um, and I'm not one that criticizes other people for the way that they look or what they wear and things like that. That's part of my thing is be you, be weird, be whatever. But you know, the rubber really hits the road when you're talking about yourself. It's easy to say, okay, it's fine for that person to be overweight. Meanwhile, I'm getting on the scale every day and trying to be fit and trying to eat healthy. Um, so there's a few things with this. So number one is I can't really afford to just be body positive with my weight when, for example, I'm very susceptible to type two diabetes. So my particular body type, um, gaining a lot of weight around the middle um, is the kind of weight that is indicative of um, type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is the kind that you sort of um, eat your way into, not something that you're born with. That's type 1 diabetes or juvenile diabetes. And so you have some control over whether you end up with type 2 diabetes based on your diet and exercise. And so uh, I could just say, okay, I'm going to be 240, 250 pounds. I'm going to have a big gut. I'm going to wear bigger clothes. I'm going to be proud of who I am. I'm a big guy. I enjoy ice cream. Who cares? Uh, but then that's going to lead to some health complications that you can't really separate from what my body looks like. Um, if I'm exercising and eating healthy, I'm not only going to have a smaller stomach, um, and look a little bit nicer in the clothes that I wear, I'm going to avoid type 2 diabetes. And that was actually one of the big uh, drivers behind me trying to get fit um, about 10 years ago was realizing I was at an age, a point in life where my dad got type 2 diabetes and I have the same body type he has. He's got thin arms and thin legs. And when he's fit, he has a, a flat, flat-ish stomach. I mean, even that, even when we're fit, we still have a stomach. Even when I was 6'4", 145 pounds, I never had abs. I never had a flat stomach. My stomach always stuck out, even when apparently there was no fat there. We just have a weird body, right? Um, and not in the way anybody finds um, attractive. So I think I have to acknowledge, and I don't, I'm not going to get into whether other people should or not, but I have to acknowledge that weight does have an impact and eating does have an impact and fat does have an impact on um, our health. One of my goals is related to my heart rate. And, and um, when you have a lower heart rate, it's indicative of a better health. And when you have a higher heart rate, um, it's indicative of worse health and carrying around extra weight for me uh, makes me feel worse. It's harder to climb the stairs. It's harder to walk around. It's just more work for your body. Imagine grabbing, um, here's how much, uh, some, you know, here is how much things weigh. If you have eight pounds that you don't need, that's like carrying around a gallon of milk with you every day. If you have 16 pounds that you don't need, 
uh, hanging on your body that's like carrying two gallons of milk. It's not a small amount. Now, it's not the same because it's not, you know, in your hands and you have to carry it around in that way, but that's that's how much it weighs. Um, and so I know that that has an impact on me um, and it has an impact on my joints and it has an impact on my body to carry that extra weight. Um, and this is where it gets into body positivity. And this is the non-health related stuff. Whether anybody else accepts me or doesn't accept me when I have a stomach that looks like I'm four and a half months pregnant or fully nine months pregnant. And I probably have looked like that in the past. I've been as high as, um, you know, 240 pounds. Um, I don't like it. And, 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 and maybe I could or I should, but I'm 50 years old now. And it doesn't matter if I tell myself it's okay, or I tell myself that it's good, or I tell myself that it's fine. And I'm not talking about self-hatred or anything like that. This is a preference. I prefer to look fit. I prefer to look healthy. I prefer that my stomach doesn't stick out over the waistband of my pants. I prefer to have a body that doesn't look disproportionate. And again, when I gain weight, it's all in my stomach. And so my body starts to look sort of lopsided. My arms and my head and my legs don't match uh, my middle and my hips and my, my stomach. And I don't like the way uh, that that looks. I don't like feeling like I'm wearing a, a pregnancy suit or a fat suit. And I think after 50 years, even if intellectually I know that it's okay, I don't like it. Now, again, it's not overwhelming to me. I don't hate myself. I don't tell myself that I'm not valuable or that I'm not a good person. And so I think I'm, I'm talking about um, the way I would describe the way I feel about you know, body positivity versus apparently body negativity for myself is I think you know, there's something to be said for body neutrality right? Um, I'm sort of neutral about my body. Um, I don't love it, um, but I don't hate it. Part of what I talk about in the freak factor is acceptance. And I think at some point we have body types. Um, you're going to gain weight where you gain weight um, and you're going to lose weight where you're going to lose weight. And you don't control that um, in the way that everybody thinks they do. Um, and, and I pay a lot of attention to this. There's incredibly fit looking um, NFL players, for example, DK Metcalf is a great example. You can Google him if you want to. He looks like he was sculpted um, by God himself. And he'll tell you that his diet is to eat a couple bags of candy throughout the day and then have dinner. Um, he's not organic. He's not vegan. He's not keto. He looks like he was sculpted. He looks like he's photoshopped. Um, he looks like the ideal specimen of athleticism. Um, and masculinity, and yet he doesn't care about or worry about what he puts into his body because he's got a different body than a lot of other people do. And there's a lot of genetics related to that, just like personality. So we shouldn't think this is the body neutrality part. We shouldn't think, oh, I could look like that if I just tried. Um, it would be almost impossible to for me to look like that. And even if I tried, it would take way more effort because like I said, he's not putting almost any effort into that body and yet he has um, that body. Um, I had a friend like that in college basketball. He would eat whatever he wanted. He never really lifted weights and yet he looked like he lifted weights all the time. He didn't try hard in practice, but it looked like he was trying the hardest if you looked at the way that he was built. And so I don't hate myself. I don't hate the way I look. I don't beat myself up for it. It doesn't affect sort of like my happiness. It's a, but if I can have things the way that I want them, I want to be thinner. I want to look fitter. I like it better when I turn to the side if I don't have a huge lump uh, sticking out of my midsection. Um, that's how I want it to be. Um, and so I think there's room um, in my mind for body neutrality. I don't need uh, other people to love uh, big guts. Um, I don't need other people to encourage me to be overweight. I don't need other people to encourage me um, that that looks fine. I don't like it. Um, but I also don't care if somebody else, I, mean, my, I tell a joke in one of my speeches about how my daughter, when she was two, asked me if I had a baby in there. 
I'm not negative about it and I don't beat myself up about it. I'm just sort of accepting of it. Um, but I'm consistently trying to do something about it and have greater or less success uh, with that. And when I have more success, I do like it more and I feel better about the way that I look. I don't know if that means I feel better about myself, but I feel better about the way I look. And I think in sort of an objective way, it looks better uh, than it looks when I'm not fit. Um, and so that's where it's really not kind of that traditional, um, you know, body positivity. The other thing I've been thinking about with that is, though, that we need to be able to isolate things, right? So we talk about body positivity or body shaming, I guess, is the body negativity side. And so I'm definitely not, and I never shame myself uh, for it. Um, but I, I think we talk about it in terms of the whole body when maybe it should be, it, it, for me, um, it's isolated. I've never been ashamed of, uh, my arms um, or my legs. And in fact, I've been thinking about that. My legs have done some amazing things. They've taken me through six Ironmans. Um, they've taken me on 100 mile running races. They've helped me accomplish all sorts of ultra marathons. My legs are really something to be proud of. They're still thin, but they're muscular and I have strong calves and I have strong quads and I have strong hamstrings, pretty much no butt. Um, to speak of. That's another part of my body type. Um, but my legs can do, right? So this is another thing, not focused on what my body looks like, but can I be for, more focused on what my body can do for me? Can I be proud of my legs and yet still frustrated with the size of my stomach, right? So I think um, part of this uh, for me uh I can be happy with the way some parts of my body are performing for me and then less happy with, you know, where other parts are and then try to, for example, strengthen those things. So for example, I can't do a pull up. One of my goals for turning 50 um, and I'm about to turn 51, which I haven't achieved yet is trying to get to the point of being able to do five pull ups. And I still to this point can't do any. And, and there's a variety of reasons for that, um, but I'm getting closer. And so I don't have that kind of strength. And plus, when you're very, very tall, it takes a lot more muscle. Um, and when you're bigger, it takes a lot more muscle to, um, to do those kinds of things. And so I'm trying to develop those things that I can to make my body be able to do the things that I want it to do so that as I get older, I can get up off the floor. I can play with my grandkids. I can pick my grandkids up off the floor so I don't become, you know, I don't have a hard time you know, going to the bathroom and do, getting in and out of cars and carrying groceries. You know, I'm starting to think about that long-term fitness, that long-term health. And so I think part of body positivity um, can be about um, what can my body do for me, not, not what does my body look like. Now, again, I think it can be hard to separate those two things because um, my body will do less for me uh, when it's bigger, because it puts a lot more strain on my body to be bigger. Um, and there's just no doubt about that. I can look at my heart rate, for example, um, during a long run, uh, when I weigh 185 pounds, and see that it's much lower, and I can run much easier and much faster for much longer than when I'm 205 pounds. That's just a reality. And when your heart rate goes up, that puts more strain on the rest of your body. You build up lactic acid, all sorts of things. Basically, everything about athletic performance is your ability to manage your heart rate. And the higher the heart rate, the more your body has to work. And the more your body has to work, the less your endurance is going to be. Those are just some physical realities. And so one of the things I've started doing to kind of shift my own mindset when it comes to my body is to not focus exclusively. And a lot of us will do that. I don't like my nose or I don't like, um, you know, you don't like the size of your arms or you don't like the size of your thighs or, you know, guys get calf implants, you know, and then some ladies upset because their calves are too big. And so we can get isolated. And I think that's one thing I do have some control over when I look down after a long run, do I see my legs that have allowed me to do amazing things? Or do I see my stomach uh, that's always been weird and always been a source of, you know, disappointment for me, right? Uh, do I see that, oh, still no six pack? 
Um, or do I see that I've got, you know, quads of steel, even though I don't have abs of steel? And so I do think that's one way that we can shift the discussion a little bit to not what um, does my body look like, or this is something I'm doing. Again, I'm not giving anybody else advice. I'm just talking through this, and maybe some of this would be helpful as you think about yourself, to what can my body do? Um, and what does my body do and what has my body done for me? And can I appreciate that instead of being frustrated with what it can't do, what it doesn't do, um, and what it doesn't look like? Um, because again, I think there's something to be said for that. I think I probably look ridiculous when I run. I saw my shadow the other day while I was running and I was running very fast. I was running a, a 5k, um, and I ran it in, you know, seven minutes and 47 seconds a mile. I ran it just over 24 minutes, which isn't fast for a high school cross country race, but it's well above average for a 50 year old man. And, um, you know, I was happy with that. But when I look at myself, I don't, I'm not looking like anybody from the Olympics. Um, and so when I finish a run though, I don't examine my appearance. I examine my statistics. What was my heart rate? What was my speed? Um, what was my average speed? Um, all of those kinds of things. And I think that's maybe a better way uh, to do it. But again, I can't escape the fact that for the kinds of things that I do, ultra marathons, Ironmans, endurance races, um, my total body weight, even if it was muscle, your total body weight has an impact on, um, you know, a strong man, the guy who wins the strong man competition uh, never wins a marathon. Um, and the people who win marathons never win strong man competitions. Um, there is an interesting person who's crossing over, but again, not with the same body. Ryan Hall is interesting. You can check him out online. He was one of America's top half marathoners and marathoners was incredibly thin, incredibly skinny. And now he's devoted all of his efforts into uh, heavy, heavy lifting, deadlifting and other kinds of things like that. And he's just packed on tons and tons and tons of muscle, totally transformed um, his body. And now he's way stronger and can lift way more and he can't run nearly as fast, right? It's a trade-off. Now he can't run nearly as fast as he used to. Um, and his wife, Sarah Hall, is an incredibly successful marathoner who doesn't lift heavy, heavy weights like him and has a completely different body because she's trying to be an Olympian. And so our bodies do, if we want them to do certain things, uh, certain types of bodies will do that for you and they won't do other things. Um, so. I think we have to acknowledge, or I acknowledge the reality of that. Um, and that's got me thinking about, again, what, is, what does my body do for me? Um, not what does my body look like? Um, but I do think there is a connection there. So anyway, those are just thoughts. I don't normally do this. That's a little bit more personal. But um, as I think about body positivity, and like I said, in pink goldfish and things, we give examples of people who are embracing that and trying to free people up to be more body positive. Um, and I think I've been very encouraging of that. But I've started to kind of ask myself, am I practicing what I preach? Um, or do I beat myself up sometimes and am critical myself sometimes? And again, I recently, you know, went to Ironman Wisconsin. And when you put on um, a skin tight triathlon suit or a skin tight wetsuit, you know, you see anything that's imperfect. And then you've got a choice of do I accept that? Um, and do I appreciate the fact that my body can do this Ironman or can do this ultra marathon or can do this triathlon? Uh, or am I critical of the way I look? Um, and I, I think that's something worth worth thinking about. So I've tried to, um, or I'm working on uh, acknowledging more. It's sort of like I'm looking past the strength of my legs, for example, and looking only at the weakness of my um, fat midsection. Um, and so I'm trying to intellectually, at least in the beginning, focus on the reality of my legs, the strength of my legs, what my legs can do, the sleekness of my legs, which again is what looks so weird in opposition to the pudginess of my stomach and see if that doesn't start to change the way I feel, not so much the way I think, right? But the way I feel um, about the way 
uh, my body looks. So just some thoughts on body positivity uh, from a weird looking uh, 50 year old man. Um, and certainly, you know, nothing that that other people probably haven't experienced as well. So hope you've enjoyed uh, this edition. As you can tell, I'm a big reader. I love books. I'm about to uh, read Subpar Parks. I'm excited about that or Subpar Planet. Sorry, Subpar Planet. Uh, I'd encourage you to check that out. Uh, check out Amber Share. Um, that book just came out. Um, you know, check out Liquid Death Mountain Water, still not sponsored by Liquid Death Mountain Water. Hmm. And uh, still not sponsored by Yeti. And uh, we are uh, using, you know, demonstrating some imperfection here on the podcast with, uh, you know, not being able to use my nice, fancy, high quality uh, camera for this episode using just my FaceTime camera in my uh, computer instead, because in uh, trying to be conscientious with uh, operating system updates, it looks like I've somehow ruined something. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Imperfectionist podcast. I am still uh, David Rendell. I'm still not sponsored by Liquid Death, still not sponsored by Yeti, um, but I'm imperfect and proud of it. I will see you next time on the Imperfectionist podcast.